Hello, this is Doug Shadell, and I'm the State Director for AARP Washington, and I want to welcome you to this important discussion about the coronavirus. Today we will discuss how you can stay informed and stay healthy with leading experts and address your questions. AARP Washington, a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization, has been working to promote health and well being for older Americans for more than 60 years. In the face of this crisis, AARP is providing information and resources to help older people and those caring for them protect themselves from the virus and prevent its spread to others. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, Older adults and people with underlying health conditions like heart disease, lung disease, and diabetes are about twice as likely to develop serious outcomes than younger, healthier people. But this is your opportunity to learn, ask questions, and get answers from leading experts. If you've participated in one of our Teletown Halls in the past, you know this is similar to a radio talk show and you have the opportunity to ask questions live. If you'd like to ask a question about the coronavirus, press star three on your telephone keypad now to be connected with an AERP staff member who will note your name and question and place you in a queue to ask that question live. To ask your question, all you have to do is press star three now. If you're just joining us, my name is Doug Shadell, State Director for AERP Washington, and I want to welcome you to this important discussion about the coronavirus. We are talking with leading experts and taking your questions live. We will focus on factual information in order to ensure you are up to date and informed to keep you and your family healthy and safe. As we proceed, I will be mentioning a couple of websites you can turn to with a lot of great up-to-date content on the coronavirus. One is our website, and that address is www.aarp.org forward slash coronavirus, www.aarp.org forward slash coronavirus. AERP is convening this Teletown Hall to supply information about the coronavirus, also referred to as COVID-19, in an effort to help protect the public. And while we see an important role for AERP to play in providing consumer information and advocacy related to the virus, the public should be aware that one of the best sources of health and medical information is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. It can be reached at cdc.gov forward slash coronavirus. That's cdc.gov forward slash coronavirus. And if you can't write all of these down, relax. We will have all of those on our website, and I'll repeat our website address later. So if you didn't get a chance to write them all down, you can just visit our site, and they will all be there. Well, it's my great pleasure and our great fortune today to have with us two top local government experts on the subject of the coronavirus. Um, and I'm gonna introduce both of them and then have each, each one give us an overview and then they will be taking your questions. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marissa D'Angeli, an epidemiologist from the Washington State Department of Health, Office of Communicable Disease Epidemiology. That was difficult to say. Dr. D'Angeli is an expert in the area of communicable diseases and will be giving us an overview of state and national efforts to curb the coronavirus. She will also stay on to answer your questions. Well, thank you, Dr. D'Angeli, for taking time out of what I'm sure is a very hectic schedule these days to speak with our members. Next, we are very fortunate hi. to- Hi. Yes, hi. Sorry, I thought I was gonna go ahead, but no, you're gonna wait. You're I'm just gonna introduce uh, Ingrid and then we'll, we'll go ahead and give you a chance to talk. Perfect. thanks. Um, I'd just like to introduce, we're also very fortunate to have Ingrid Ulrey, who is the Policy Director for Seattle King County Health Department. Ingrid has a wealth of experience and knowledge in the public health area and will be filling us in on developments going on right here in King County. Thank you for being here, Ingrid. Um, we want to give each of our public health experts a chance to provide a brief overview of the situation here regarding the coronavirus and answer some of your burning questions. We've already heard from members who have a lot of these questions. There's a lot of stuff in the media right now, and we're trying to give you this, just the straight factual information. Answers to questions like, what is the coronavirus? How is it spread? How do we avoid it? What are state and local agencies doing to keep us safe? And what are challenge the challenges that might be unique to the 60 plus population regarding the virus? Once we hear from our public health officials, we'll spend the rest of our time answering your questions. So if you have a question about the coronavirus, please press star three on your telephone keypad now, and you will be connected to one of our staff who will place you in the queue. 
Well, Dr. D'Angeli, perhaps you would like to go first and give our audience an overview of the situation from the perspective of state health officials. Hi there. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Doug, and um, also thank you to the organizers of the call for inviting me to speak to you. Um, we, I, we're really interested in getting important information out to you um, so that you can all stay healthy during this outbreak. So I, I'm going to try to be brief. I've divided my remarks up into a few different sections. Um, and first of all, what is the coronavirus? Well, there are actually many different coronaviruses, um, and there are seven that infect humans. The, the majority of them cause very mild illness, just a cold. Um, and this is this new one that we are calling SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is a new one um, just recently uh, identified in, last year um, that causes severe illness. And um, so first I'm gonna go into the global situation. Uh, just yesterday, the World Health Organization made the, the announcement that now the COVID-19 is a pandemic. And so a pandemic is a scary word, um, but what it basically means is that there is widespread transmission of a new virus or a, a new disease. And there is little to no human immunity and it spreads easily between people. And what we know from past pandemics is that it will eventually infect 30 to 50% of the world's population. Um, and so our goal in public health is to spread those illnesses out over a lot of time so that we can allow time for a vaccine and medications to be developed and also protect the um, healthcare system so that healthcare is available to people who need it. Currently, there are over 100,000 cases that have been identified in um, over 110 countries, and about 80% of the cases are mild, um, with about 20% more serious, 15% severe, 5% critical. Uh, we also believe that people can be asymptomatically infected but still transmit the virus. And that's what makes this one particularly difficult to control. And um, the um, severity does appear to be very strongly associated with age and also underlying conditions. Um, and uh, what I just recently heard that although the overall case fatality rate, the, the proportion of cases that result in death, is between 0.5 to 3.5 percent in those older than 80 it's about 15 percent so this is really serious for older people and with those who have um, underlying conditions so in our state um, our numbers change rapidly um, but as of yesterday we had 366 cases uh, mostly in the Puget Sound area uh, with about um, a, small numbers of cases scattered over about nine other counties. We have had 29 deaths and most of the cases in Washington have been people older than 60 years and also the deaths have been concentrated in those older than 60 and also those with underlying conditions. Now I want to focus a little bit on the public health pandemic response. So public health response is divided into two different phases. One is called containment, which is where we try to identify every case, isolate them to prevent them from spreading the illness to other people, and then tracking down all of their contacts and quarantining them so that if they were to become ill, they won't be spreading it. At some point though, we want run out of resources to maintain this high level of effort and also in this situation, because of mild and asymptomatic infection, we really may not be able to identify every case. So in that situation, we have to switch over to what we call mitigation. And mitigation um, is actions that we take individually and at the community level to prevent infections and 
prevent transmission to slow the epidemic. Overall, the goal of both containment and mitigation is to minimize illnesses and deaths and to spread out cases over a longer time, as I mentioned earlier, in the hopes that vaccine and medication will be developed. Now I want to switch in just very briefly to the governor's recent recommendations regarding long-term care. Um, it's been frightening to all of us, um, the um, deaths associated with long-term care facilities. Um, we're really sad about that. And so the governor has responded by um, uh, making an emergency declaration of things that long-term care facilities must do. And this is focused on four different areas. One is visitor restriction. Um, we, we believe that um, the COVID-19 uh, virus was introduced to these long-term care facilities, but we don't know by whom. So it could be a family member, it could be a patient, it could be a vendor, it could be a staff person, a, a healthcare worker, we really don't know. But so we wanna uh, limit visitors at the facility and also actively screen all the visitors and all people entering the facility, and that would include the vendors, everyone else, to make sure no one who's sick is coming in. Um, the same thing is done for the healthcare personnel, making sure that no one who is sick is working in the facility. Um, the same thing then is done for the residents to monitor them and find out if anyone is sick and immediately isolate them to prevent that illness from spreading to other people. And finally, um, just uh, really emphasizing infection prevention and control within the facility, both using gowns and gloves and masks and also hand washing and environmental cleaning to prevent um, illnesses from being transmitted within the facility. So, so that's the summary of the governor's um, uh, recommendations. And um, finally, I just want to spend a minute talking about individual actions that people can take. And this too is divided into two different um, uh, phases, kind of one where there's no outbreak happening in our area, where we just do all the things that we normally should do, wash our hands, stay away from sick people, um, cover our coughs and sneezes, um, stay home when we're sick. Uh, but when we have a community outbreak, like what's happening now, we need to do more. And that's where some of the recent recommendations come in of trying to stay away, stay six feet, feet away from people, avoid crowds, stay home as much as possible. Um, and prepare to be able to stay at home by stocking up on your everyday needs, ensuring that you have medicines at home. Um, another really important thing is to keep up to date on your vaccinations. So I'm going to stop there okay. and I'll let Ingrid go ahead and speak and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Dr. D'Angeli. I appreciate that. And we have over almost 3,500 people on the phone call and lots of questions generated already. Um, if you're just joining us, I'm Doug Shadell, State Director for AERP Washington, and you're listening to a tele Teletown Hall meeting where we have public health experts answering your questions. You were just listening to Marissa D'Angeli, who is an epidemiologist from the Washington State Department of Health. Thank you for that excellent overview. I'd like to turn now to, uh, before we get to your questions, and please, if you're in the queue, stay on the line. We want to answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, I want to get to Ingrid Ulrey, who is going to give us an overview from the perspective her, in her role as the Director of Public Policy for the Seattle King County Health Public Health Department. Ingrid? Doug, thank you so much. I am so grateful to AARP for hosting this call and helping to get the word out to your members about the most important things they can do to stay safe. I mean, this is more important than ever to be in communication, so thank you. Uh, th and thank you, Dr. D'Angelo, for that important explanation and information. I want to just take it up a level and for the people on the phone, um, I want to highlight three things. And many people are asking themselves, why is this happening? It's a scary thing. It's a once in a lifetime event to live through this type of pandemic. 
And I think three important things to remember about this disease, which I will call COVID-19. Uh, one is, I'm going to say what they are. Is one is there's no, we as human beings have no immunity to this disease. It just newly jumped from animals to humans. Second, there is no treatment. We have not yet developed antiviral treatments. The only thing that we can treat people for at this time are the symptoms. And the third is we do not yet have a vaccine to prevent the spread of the disease. Those are three important things to understand about why this is spreading so vastly and quickly across the globe and why the, most in, the one tool in our tool chest that is the very most important thing we can do right now are measures to prevent that spread through our personal behaviors, and through the way we operate as a society. The Dr. D'Angelo talked about those personal behaviors. We'll be stressing that throughout the call. There's a lot you can do yourself to reduce your risk. Most importantly is staying at home and avoiding large gatherings. Personal hygiene, like consistently and thoroughly washing your hands, not touching your face, avoiding people who are sick, not sharing personal items, and being prepared, having the medications you know you need on hand and filled, um, and having other household items and groceries stocked in your kitchen. That's what you can do as a person. As a society, we can take measures to protect everyone. Uh, Dr. D'Angelo mentioned yesterday the governor of our state, Governor Jay Inslee, um, put forth a prohibition on major events uh, large events involving uh, more than 250 individuals. This is important, and we have gone a step farther here in our county in C for Seattle and King County. In addition to the governor's orders, our local health officer issued an order that also prohibits gatherings of individuals of less than 250 individuals at one time unless they can meet specific cautionary criteria. And most importantly, we care and concerned about the most vulnerable among us who are most threatened by this disease, which includes people age 60 plus and individuals with underlying health conditions. We have clear information about what, how we are defining those underlying health conditions which in the Q&A, we are happy to follow up with more detail. I'm gonna conclude just by saying, if you have questions specific to yourself or your family, uh, an important resource I wanna share for people in King County uh, is our call center. And the number for that, and I'm sharing, I can share with AARP so they can share out in King County as well, is 206. 477-3977. So thank you everyone for taking responsibility to get this information and being on this call. Excellent, thank you, Ingrid. Uh, that was Ingrid Ulrey from the King County Public Health Department. She's the Director of Public Policy and you've been listening to a Teletown Hall on the coronavirus. And now we're gonna get to your questions. And I gotta tell you folks, I don't think I've ever done a Teletown Hall where I've seen more questions. Uh, in our queue than right now. So we're really gonna try and focus on taking advantage of the experts we have, uh, Dr. D'Angeli and Ingrid um, Ulrey. Let's go to uh, our first question, Nancy in Kirkland. Hello, my question is <clears throat> the difference between an allergy, a cold, and the, the coronavirus. They're different um, symptoms. And um, I know I have some allergies and I don't have a fever. I don't have aches and pains. I don't know if my doctor would even give me a coronavirus test. But, but when do you start thinking maybe it's not a cold? Dr. D'Angeli, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I'll do my best. So um, that's a great question. And um, I will uh, say that it sometimes can be a little bit hard to differentiate. Um, so allergies uh, 
tend to cause nasal congestion, uh, watery eyes, and sometimes itchy eyes and nose. Um, allergies should not cause body aches, fever, um, severe sore throat, uh, extreme fatigue. So that would be one way to differentiate whether it's a viral infection versus an allergy. Um, and sometimes it's just going to take a day or two for you to try to figure out what's going on. Um, and then to, de- to try to differentiate between a cold and the coronavirus, that too can be difficult because we know that some people are very mildly affected by the coronavirus. Um, and our best advice at this time is that if you are sick, stay home. Try to isolate yourself from other people so you don't make them sick. And um, we, we know that some people with coronavirus are going to do just fine, and we don't really need to diagnose every case. However, I think if you're in the high-risk group, it is a good idea to find out whether you have coronavirus so that way your uh, health care provider and family members can follow you a little bit more closely to make sure severe illness doesn't happen. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that answer. If you're just joining us, this is a Teletown Hall on the coronavirus, sponsored by AARP. And we have two experts, Ingrid Ulry and Marissa D'Angelo, Dr. D'Angeli, I'm sorry. And let's go back to the phones now. We have uh, Beverly from Bellevue. Go ahead, you're on the air. Beverly? Okay. Uh, Maybe we'll get back to her. Let's try another question. How about Dolores? Dolores, are you there? Yes, I am here. Go ahead. Do you have a question? I do. I need to do some grocery shopping, and I'm afraid to bring anything home. Uh, I take Clorox wipes and do everything that I touch on the way in and the way out. But am I safe to buy food from the deli, or am I better to buy canned foods, or... Shall I eat what's in my cabinets that have been here for some time? I just don't know what I can buy. Boy, that's a great question. I have that same question. (laughs) Who wants to take that? (laughs) Um, This is Ingrid. I can speak to that. Dolores, thank you so much. It's so important that we have the nutrition we need to stay healthy. Um, Right at this point in time and going forward, it's critical that the grocery stores remain open, even though that is a location where we will be Uh, interfacing with others at at a close distance, and there's a need for great caution. Uh, One option which you could consider is ordering in your groceries so you don't need to be exposed to other people when you go out. Uh, We've had high-level discussions locally with some of the vendors who provide a grocery delivery, going through with them some protocols around enhanced sanitation recommendations and also procedures where they can, or processes, where they can arrange with clients to drop groceries at the door and understand that they don't want any to have any human interface in that process. So that's one idea, and I think you're thinking creatively. And I would uh, I would defer to my environmental health food safety um, experts, but I would agree with your common sense that food that is rather than food pre-prepared food from a deli, things that are sealed. Uh, would be have a greater chance of ensuring that no one has touched what you will be touching. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. D'Angeli, you have anything to add to that, or should we get to another question? I think Ingrid did a great job on that one. All right, let's go to the phones. And I really want to press these, but we have so many people wanting to ask you guys questions. Um, Sharon from Federal Way. Sharon? Yes, hello. Thank you for taking my call. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question about travel. I have adult family members that have uh, reservations for Vegas this weekend. Uh, They're all adults, uh, not in the older section. Well, two are 60. But they also, um, one has diabetes. um, And the other uh, question is going to Italy uh, in July. And what do they do about reservations if you say they shouldn't be going? Are they able to get any reimbursal? Who wants to take that one? Travel abroad. I, uh, how about we tag team it? Um, let me speak to the um, what I know, and then Dr. D'Angeli, please add in. So currently, there are no 
travel restrictions uh, in and out of King County or Washington State. There were some new travel restrictions announced by the federal government yesterday regarding travel to Europe. Um, those are on the CDC website, and I would recommend looking closely at those. Um, big picture, at this time, in terms of personal behaviors, especially with people with an underlying health condition like diabetes, it is highly recommended to avoid gatherings where you will come in close contact within six feet of other individuals. So for that is something to take seriously and to inform when people are making decisions about travel. Any comments, Dr. D'Angeli? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Ingrid just said. Um, everyone has a different tolerance for risk, and it can be really hard to give up on fun plans. Um, but uh, I think everyone in that group really needs to think about the activities they'll be doing, the things they'll be touching, the places they'll be, um, and think about what their own personal risk is. Um, and uh, and then make a decision that's best for you. Very good. Um, let's uh, before we go into the, another phone call. The, the call we lost. I want to ask you folks this question because it's coming up a lot. And uh, Beverly was going to ask, is it okay to visit her grandkids? She's 81 years old. We didn't get far enough to know whether there's underlying health conditions on her part. But this is a question we're getting a lot, which is. You know, grandkids, grandparents want to interact with each other. Is it okay for her to take care of her grandkids, especially given the fact that we've got closed schools now here, and that's going to come up? Well, I can start. Oh, go I ahead. Really, um, you oh, go I first, and I'll add in. Okay, yeah. Um, that's, that is, a, again, it is going to be a personal decision. Um, one thing I think people really have to be aware of is that children um, appear to be very mildly affected by this illness yet can still be infected and either show no symptoms at all or just have um, very mild symptoms that you might not otherwise pay attention to but can still transmit it to other people now um, so there's definitely a risk from being around children um, on the other hand you have to think about the joy um, that you get from spending with those children um, you know, from a health perspective, it is uh, probably safer to stay away um, and visit with them uh, some other ways, like via Skype or um, text messaging or things like that. Ingrid, what do you think? Beverly, I just want to thank you for raising this. I think this is one of the hardest um, the difficult decisions and calculus that uh, many, many people are grappling with based on the science that Dr. D'Angeli just shared. I know for myself, uh, last weekend I had a plan to bring my son to visit his grandparents, my father over 80, undergoing cancer treatments. I consulted with a number of the experts I happen to work with here in the building and for myself, for my own personal decision, canceled that trip. So I do think it's a matter of personally weighing the pros and cons and having full transparency um, and understanding if um, the joy and the quality of life and importance of being with the grandkids is worth uh, the risk that you would be taking. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, that was Ingrid Ulry from the King County Public Health Department. And we've also got Dr. Marissa D'Angeli from the State Department of Health Ep Epidemiology Department. This is AARP Teletown Hall on coronavirus, and we are going to keep on the phone lines because we've got a ton of calls. Norman from Bellevue, you have a question for our panel? Yes. Is there an expectation that COVID-19 will go away in warmer weather like the influenza virus does? Dr. D'Angeli? Uh, we don't know. Um, if it behaves like other respiratory viruses that have a seasonal pattern, it is um, expected that it would lessen. However, we think it'll come back. Um, but we really don't know what's gonna happen because it's just too new. Okay. We're hopeful though. <laughs> I mean, that would be nice, but we don't really know. That's important to, to realize. Okay, how about um, Meryl from Kirkland? Meryl? Hi, yeah. Go ahead, do you have a question? Um, my question is, 
about acquired immunity. Let's say you do get COVID-19 and you recover. Do you then have immunity from it? Ah. And, and then the other question is, um, how quickly are we expecting COVID-19 to mutate so that if there is an immunity, it wouldn't be effective against a, a new strain? Do we know that? Yeah, good question. I uh, want me to try that one. Yeah, um, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> it's okay to say we don't know, by the way, because I realize this is so new. <laughs> yeah, I, you're asking questions that we all want to know the answer to, and again, it's really too early to know for sure what how this uh, virus is going to behave. If it's like many other respiratory viruses. It's true, once we've been infected, we develop some immunity. So if we encounter that virus again, it doesn't affect us as severely. Um, there have been anecdotal reports out of China that people who have been infected and recovered have been reinfected. So that, that um, is information that makes us kind of nervous, but we really just don't know the answer. Um, I don't know if you have some kind of science background, Meryl, but you're asking really hard questions. Um, COVID-19 is an RNA virus, which are um, typically um, very, um, th their replication is um, uh, um, error prone. So that means they tend to mutate more. But again, we just don't know. Um, if you look at some of the information that's available uh, about other similar viruses like SARS and MERS, um, these viruses are, are very similar but still differ by, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. Um, and we know that there's a whole host of coronaviruses that bats carry, so they're kind of lying in wait to make that jump to humans. Um, but the bottom line is we just don't know. Anything to add to that, Ingrid? I do not. Okay. Um, if you're just joining us, you're listening to a Teletown Hall about the coronavirus, and I just want to um, interject here that we're, gonna, we're giving out a lot of phone numbers and websites. If you wanted uh, one place to go to get all of that, we have created um, a list on our website, and you can go to AARP, www.aarp org forward slash coronavirus and we're trying to list all the state federal local resources we can on that uh, website let's go back to the phones um, Marvel go ahead I have, um, <clears throat> I have uh, an appointment in about a week and a half for an abscess tooth I have uh, apparently an infection in my tooth which should really be taken care of uh, would it be um, a good idea to keep that appointment. Clinical, yeah. so I defer to the doctor. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer. Um, do you want to comment on, she has a dental, Marvel was talking about having a dental appointment coming up, and is it safe to go to the dental appointment? In about a week. Yeah, in about, about a week. 10 days. Yeah, you want me to take that? Yeah, who uh, wouldn't this mind? Is, this is Dr. Donjali. Yeah, so um, an abscess tooth seems like something that um, is, pretty important to take care of. Number one, you're probably in a lot of pain. And number two, um, that infection could potentially spread. Um, and so it seems like that's one of those higher priority appointments that you would probably want to keep. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm sure that dentists are, uh, um, you know, really trying to keep sick people out of their uh, offices. Um, and you can take all those same um, measures of trying to keep six feet away from, from other people in the waiting room, you know, wash your hands after you've touched things. Um, again, the, um, you know, ultimately you will be the one making that decision, but it seems like an abscess tooth is, is higher priority. Good. You know, that raises the sort of general question about elective surgery right now. Do you want to address that? Just all else being equal, is this the time when one should put off elective surgery if it's not urgent, like an abscess tooth? What would you say about that? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that there's a couple of uh, reasons to uh, 
postpone elective surgery. Um, one is that when you go to a healthcare facility, you are surrounded by sick people. So that's kind of a high risk environment. The other thing is, although you know, public health hasn't said to delay elective procedures, uh, at this point in time, it's not a bad idea to try to reserve health care for people who are really sick and need it. So those are two good reasons that I could think of for postponing elective procedures. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Doug, can I just add to that? Um, yeah. One thing we really want to do is preserve um, capacity and access in our health care system for those with severe symptoms. And it's very important if people are having some mild symptoms or are concerned or worried not to go to the emergency department. Uh, we ask them instead to contact their primary care provider and do some triage over their phone or, or and to determine if they need to go into the primary care provider's office. Very important. Yeah, that's a good point. We've been hearing that, but that's really good to reiterate here. Thank you. Uh, Ingrid, I have another question for you, Ingrid, before we go back to the phones. Um, someone asked this question and then had to hang up or whatever, but it's the general question of social distancing. Uh, we heard from Dr. D'Angeli that the governor has, and, and from you too, that the governor has sort of put a ban on large crowds. But what that leaves a lot of, am, I don't want to say ambiguity, but what about you know groups of 10? What about going to your senior center? What about smaller crowds? Is there any guidance King County's giving us on that question? Um, and just what do we mean by social distancing, I guess? It might be good to just, just explain that. Yes, great question, thank you. So first of all, social distancing is just a, uh, a term uh, regarding how close to people will you be and for how long. So the general recommendation, especially for older people and those with underlying health conditions, is to as much as at all possible remain six feet away from other individuals um, and if you have to be closer to any other to, than that to avoid the duration of the contact uh, for just as few minutes as possible. Um, you're right that the um, public health King County order that came out uh, yesterday is prohibiting events and gatherings less than less than 250 people and there are some criteria that if anyone wants to host an event less than 250 people uh, that order included some key criteria one there's uh, just i'm just going to say what they were one is around vulnerable persons that i just described are encouraged not to to attend events or gatherings of any size and the cdc guidance issued yesterday goes further and says um, old vulnerable persons should not gather in events larger than 10 people. Um, second is the, the issue of staying uh, the six feet distance or arm's length is another way to think about it. Um, arm's length away um, for ideally t not for any closer than 10 minutes or longer. Um, the third is uh, if there is an event or less than 250 people uh, we are asking event organizers um, or employees involved in organizing the event to be screened for coronavirus um, symptoms um, ahead. The, the next is uh, to, to provide the event should provide hand hygiene and sanitation, make it readily available to all at attendees. And the, the, the next is environmental cleaning guidelines, is that any event, if there is going to be an event, they should follow the environmental cleaning guidelines around cleaning and disinfecting high-touch services. So those are the criteria. We are currently working on some sub-guidelines to be more specific when we get asked the question, um, is this event less than, uh, for less than 250 people uh, recommended or not? Okay, great, thank you, boy. Um, that leads me to think it's better to just not go to one of those events, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's tough That to would be a very, logical conclusion and, and avoid for, events at all costs if you can yeah i mean with those kinds of specific guidelines and restrictions the public health is it sounds like really saying discouraging it at some level let's go to another question uh linda from snohomish linda hi how are you today good good you have a question 
Yeah, I do. Um, we're basically huddled in. We've decided not to go to any events or anything, but we're going to go crazy. So what about out- outdoor activities? Like if we go walk the trail or we go to the beach or take the dog or work in the gardens, are we fairly safe doing that in our own environment and steering clear of people? Yeah. Dr. Marissa, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, Linda, I can sympathize, yeah, that you will be going stir crazy being inside. And um, I think that you are proposing some really great uh, alternatives to getting uh, together uh, in groups. So, yeah, getting outside, exercising, enjoying nature, um, but staying six feet away from other people. Um, I, I think that's a great way to, um, you know, manage uh, the need to isolate or quarantine, excuse me, and um, to still stay, stay sane. We have, you know, we in the uh, in the aging world talk about social isolation all the time as generally not a good thing for people's health, but probably not talking about forever here. And these seem like precautions that make sense given the just the unknown nature of what we're what we're facing. Let me get to another question um, from S- Sabra in Edmonds. Sabra? Hi. Hi, go ahead. Well, thanks for answering my, uh, or helping me get an answer to my question. Um, uh, You know, my husband and I are in our late 60s, and we do have an adult daughter living with us in our home, and she's an employee at a grocery store, and um, we just have some concerns about you know, we're practicing, you know, uh, mitiga- the mitigation approach of just, you know, staying at home, you know, avoiding crowds, that type of thing. But, you know, she does come home from working, you know, at a store. And um, I know there's a lot of people in our situation, you know, adults with um, or elder people like myself with, um, you know, adult children living at home, but who are still, you know, working outside, you know. So any kind of... Um, recommendations on that I leave it up to you all who wants to take that one <laughs> good luck <laughs> Ingrid you want to talk I, about that okay. I would just be, mention that I understand the concern um, so that you're doing the best you can in terms of curtailing your activity but you're current concerned about exposure via your daughter who's been out in the public and and um, in in social contact with many people during the day I think um, it, this, again, is a personal decision um, as to what action you take. I think the most important action is um, enhanced um, caution around uh, the personal hygiene. For example, when she gets home from her job is to you know, change your clothes, thoroughly wash her hands, um, ensure that you're not having physical contact with her um, you know, as limited as possible. So all those personal behaviors that we're recommending, um, just ensuring that not only you are doing that, but you're asking her to be vigilant about that as well. Dr. Angeli, do you have anything to add to that? Or Yeah, you, I think that was a great answer. The only thing I'd add is that um, the daughter who's out in public have some hand sanitizer there at the cash register, um, have some disinfecting wipes that she's wiping down things at her register, just to try to minimize uh, anything coming into her area. Right. If you're just joining us, um, you're listening to a conversation about the coronavirus with Dr. Marisa Angeli, an epidemiologist from the Washington State Department of Health. Um, and Ingrid Ulrey from the King County Public Health Department. And boy, I sure appreciate the two of you taking this this time. We're going to have to take the full hour here because there's lots more questions. Can you stay on a little bit longer, you two? I hope. Yes, I can. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's take another call then. Uh, Irma from Linwood. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Do you have a question for our panel? Yes, my question is about how long the virus survives on surfaces. Um, We've heard varying ranges from a half an hour to a day to nine days. So bringing groceries in the house that have been delivered to us have been handled by someone, and we're wondering if we have to wait nine days to open my can of beans. Great question. 
I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Luckily, we have experts. <laughs> <laughs> Irma, that's a great question. Um, and I have heard all those same numbers that you have. Um, and I, I think the answer is that it really depends on what the surface is. Um, what the temperature and humidity are and um, how it's been treated. But um, I don't think it's necessary to wait nine days before opening your can of beans, but I would consider wiping things down um, and washing your hands after you handle things that have been handled by other people. Can I ask a follow-up to that? What about, um, part of this is just stuff we've been hearing in the media to dispel or factor fiction, but what about wearing, I mean, I've had these same concerns myself going to the grocery store and thinking about all the people who might have touched the apple I was just about to put in my cart. And what about like gloves? Is, is gloves, and what about gloves and masks? Can we just address that? I, I don't know if they're a good idea or not, but there's lots of questions about that. Want me to take that? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, and I, I might have a follow-up, go ahead. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, first of all, I think that, that um, putting on gloves and a mask is a really um, understandable um, um, idea. Uh, and there are certain situations where it's definitely recommended. Um, in most situations, though, it's probably not going to be super helpful. So um, for gloves, um, we definitely recommend that healthcare workers use them to keep themselves, keep their hands from getting contaminated, um, both to protect themselves and also to prevent transmission to other people. Um, however, any time, even if you're wearing gloves, you have to perform hand uh, hygiene after taking those gloves off. That's for healthcare workers as well as people who are just wearing them. Um, so if you're gonna be touching something um, th th that's dirty, sure, wear gloves, but then take them off, throw them away, and wash your hands or use hand sanitizer. Um, and the other thing about wearing gloves um, as an in, uh, 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 you know, a person in the community is that if you have something on your hands, you're kind of less likely to touch your face, which is really important um, that we not touch our face with dirty hands. Um, so that's gloves. Um, for the masks, we, also, we recommend that people wear masks if they are coughing or sneezing or have a respiratory illness to prevent spreading it to other people. Um, and then if you are around other people who are sick and they can't wear a mask, then wearing a mask can help prevent um, you from getting those respiratory droplets in your mouth or nose. Um, as far as all the pictures you see of people just walking around on the street near, you know, not around anyone else, but they're wearing a mask, that probably is not helpful at all. Ingrid, what do you have to say? I just want to add that we have an unprecedented shortage of things like gloves and masks and what we call um, personal protective equipment. And the number one priority, because there's been such a huge drive in demand, uh, for these items is that we preserve uh, the stock for healthcare workers most exposed. So I, I, I understand there's probably some frustration from people on the line of it being difficult to find the items that you would like, including even hand sanitizer in the pharmacies and local retail, and just be aware that this is a symptom of the broader shortage of personal protective equipment nationwide and globally. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question is from Ellen in Sammamish. Ellen? Uh, yes, it's me. Oh, okay. My question is, my, my family is flying in from England uh, today. When they, when they come home, do I hug them? Do I touch them? Should they, do we stay far apart? What should they do before we touch? Elbow bump, maybe. <laughs> Dr. D'Angeli, you want to take that one? Well, sure. Um, well, uh, similar to that um, employee coming home from the grocery store, um, your relatives have been out in public, potentially exposed to a lot of other people. Their clothing, their hands may be contaminated. So probably a good idea to um, 
blow some kisses from a distance, have them go clean up, change their clothes, wash their hands, uh, potentially take a shower. Um, and then, um, uh, of course, you want to hug and kiss your family members. Um, uh, just uh, do your best to try to keep your distance to um, minimize any transmission that could be even happening in your home. Ingrid, what do you think? Agree. Yeah, I mean, one of the challenges here is that, that we seem to be the the epicenter of this right now, and if people from other areas where it's not the epicenter may not be aware of the acute nature of the of, of what's going on in Seattle. Um, so that's another piece is to probably educate them about what's going on here. Let's go to um, Sandra in Bothell. Sandra. Uh, yes, hello. I think that my question has been already answered, but I want to express my appreciation for your discussion this morning, and I'm finding it very interesting because it is answering questions that I hadn't even thought of yet. Oh, yeah? So well, uh, I'm just going to hang on if it's possible. Well, and go, ahead, listen. go ahead and ask, and if, if we've already answered it, there, you know, repetition is the mother of education, so <laughs> well, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, my question had to do with uh, uh, if you have underlying seasonal allergies or, or even a, a, a cold rather than uh, something that I, like I have no fever or anything of that nature, but I have spring, this happens every spring with sinus things, issues. Yeah. So uh, that was my question. Well, I think we were talking before, Dr. D'Angeli, about how to tell the difference maybe between allergies and the virus. I think she's asking does the presence of an allergy or a sinus condition make me more inclined, more likely to get the virus? Yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, you know, I had never thought of that before, um, and I don't know the answer. Yeah. Um, it is true when you have inflammation of mucous membranes that they may be more per... Um, uh, permeable to uh, infectious agents, but I really don't know the answer to that question. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, it seems like it has to do with the immune system, but I don't know the answer either. So um, uh, let's go to, Ingrid, do you want to take a shot at that or? Nope. Okay. Um, let's go to Arlene in Normandy Park. Arlene. Yes. Um, if you're the only one in the house, and you and you do get sick, and of course so we haven't had disinfectant wipes or any of that stuff in the stores for more than a week or whatever. What should you do to kind of make your safe house safe so you don't reinfect yourself? You're trying to get better. Ingrid, do you want to take that one? On the on the scientific question of whether you could reinfect yourself, I will defer to Dr. D'Angeli. Okay. I would say I would say though, if people are self quarantining and isolated in their own homes, um, they should reach out for assistance. Uh, we are working closely with the Aging and Disability Services of King County, and you can connect with them through our hotline. We can refer you. Um, but we want to make sure that people have what the, the most, the safest thing to do if you're having mild to moderate symptoms is to self-quarantine at home so as not to expose others. And I think there are many uh, organizations in the community here in King County who want to safely provide support wraparound services to assist people who who want to self who need to and want to self quarantine and don't have family members who can do, do simple things like run to the pharmacy for a medication refill so my recommendation if anyone on the phone is in that situation isolated no caregiver or friends or family to support them in their in self quarantining. Please call our hotline, and they will refer you to some available assistance as we can. So again, the hotline is two zero six four seven seven three nine seven seven. Great. Anything to add, Dr. Angeli? Um, I think that Ingrid really covered the 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 um, importance of people being able to access. Um, resources and support. I just um, had wondered whether uh, Irma was asking about, oh no, Arlene, I'm sorry, asking about 
um, what to use instead of disinfecting wipes. And I just wanted you to know you can use household bleach to make a disinfectant solution. Um, just be sure to wear gloves and protect your clothing from that. <laughs> Are you here with us reading these questions? That was the very next question someone was gonna ask about bleach. You wanna expand on that a little bit? Is that literally true that you can just use bleach instead of a normal, um, you wanna say a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm actually doing a quick search to find what the um, concentration is. It's a, a small amount of bleach in um, a basin of water um, and I can, I'll keep trying to look okay. it up. Okay, good. Uh, but um, just that, yeah, household bleach is great. Um, and some of the reasons why it's not used more frequently is because it can harm surfaces. Um, and also because some people have sensitivity to the smell. Mm. Um, so just be sure to use some, um, you know, try not to breathe in the, the fumes and protect your hands and clothing. And I will keep trying to look up that concentration for home use. Great, okay. Next question. And Doug, just, if I, yeah, if sure. I could add that the, I know that the recipe for uh, making your own um, disinfectant is uh, an, an, one, an example of the issue that's come up. We have a task force uh, for, to support the community specific to older adults, uh, which AARP, I know you are participating in. We're really grateful for that. I know we have that recipe and maybe after this call you could circulate to your members. Yeah, good. We'll post it on our website. That's that's a really good point. I just want to do a time check here. This has actually never happened before, but we have so many questions. Could you two stay an extra 10 minutes? We're supposed to be ending right about now, but we've got quite a few more questions. I'd like to take as many as possible. Is that okay with you guys? I can stay. Okay, just another sort of eight or 10 minutes, and then we will promise to let you on your way, because I know you've got a lot of busy stuff to do. How about another question from... Deneen in Seattle. Hi. Um, I was just wondering about test kits. I keep hearing about their availability or non-availability and if there are some available in Seattle, King County. How about that? I'll take that one. I, sorry? Oh, go ahead. Um, Ingrid, do you want to take it? Um, let me let me start and let me have you add in. Um, so regarding the availability of testing, um, this has been evolving quickly. Um, initially at the outbreak, we had very limited ability for testing. We were only testing in the state lab. We're very relieved that now the private sector has stepped up and we've significantly increased capacity for testing. The, the part of the testing where there continues uh, to be um, some limitations is in the capacity around collecting the specimens and getting them delivered to the labs. So that there, it, it is recommended, it was announced nationally that everyone who needs a test should get a test. We also ask people to use, um, use their judgment that the most important uh, people to be tested are healthcare providers who could spread to other people and those um, with more severe illness. So testing has been um, a challenging issue to ramp up quickly, but I think there's a lot of progress being made on that front right now. Great, Dr. Dan. Yeah, I think that you, you, you covered it really well, Ingrid. Um, the only thing is I know that the, in the media they've been talking about test kits, and um, it's not that healthcare facilities are waiting for someone to deliver test kits. Um, it, uh, because it's just a common used swab that's used to collect a specimen. It really is in um, the capacity to perform the sample collection and then find a place to have it tested. Okay, we're gonna take three more questions and then we're gonna have to wrap up because these two folks are very busy, as you can imagine, during this, this uh, crisis. Let's go to uh, Mary in Kirkland. Hi. Hi, go ahead. I had a, I had a question about um, the, um, the being a carrier. And I hear this a lot, and I wasn't sure how it pertains to people. I was wondering if I had been exposed to someone and I didn't know it, and I'm out and about as a carrier, 
Can I give it to anyone if I go perhaps uh, to the library or um, I run in the store to get milk or something? That's a good question. When you say carrier, oh. touch something and then somebody else touches that same thing, and I mean, that's who wants to take that? That's a good question. That a lot of on a lot of people's minds, I think. I want to defer yeah, okay. to Dr. D'Angeli for the transmission. Okay. Well, I mean, I think there's. I understood the question slightly differently, but I think Doug raised an important question. So, um, Mary, we think that peop there can be people who are carrying the virus and do not appear to be ill and therefore can spread it through their respiratory droplets. For example, you blow your nose and then don't wash your hands and touch something that someone else has touched touches and then they rub their eyes and it gets transmitted that way. Um, the other thing is that you could touch something that's dirty uh, with the virus on it and then um, touch something else and pass it on that way. And th we think that that is one of the ways that it could be get transmitted in healthcare facilities. Um, so um, Mary, we would say that if you are Sick, you should stay home and um, in this time of an outbreak we are recommending that people try to minimize their interaction with other people as much as possible um, and then um, it sounds like you're concerned about spreading it to other people which is great we appreciate that um, but uh, the grocery store and um, the library are places where you can try to um, stay six feet away from other people and um, take care of the things that you need to take care of. Ingrid, have anything else to add? No, I think that's a good thorough answer. Very good, thank you. We've got two more. Uh, let's hear from Gary in Auburn. Gary? Yes, uh, I'm calling about uh, the contact that a person runs into when they go out um, I'm 76 and I have the emphy emphysema and my wife does a lot of the shopping for me and she's going out right now and we we're just discussing whether we should use a delivery service and then disinfect whatever they bring to us and how would we handle it if it was vegetables or produce item and, and she's, she's going to the store. What is the safe distance for her to maintain at, at this store? And uh, other distances I'm concerned about was when we receive our mail, do we need to spray it down? And uh, we have uh, a friend that's in the medical uh, field that uses the product to uh, keep their uh, nose relatively free of any infection, but they use a product called Nose In, and uh, how effective is that if for a virus? Those were a number of questions there, but those are the ones that were on my mind, and I've been really uh, influenced a lot by this conversation I've heard from uh, other people here on the, this line. It's been very informative. Thank you, Gary. Dr. D'Angeli? Yeah, I'm this is sorry, transmission I'm again, I yeah. think, but it coming from a different couple different angles. <laughs> uh, do you, Dr. D'Angeli, uh, let me let me start, and then you can add. Please um, do. I yeah. want to know the answer to um, the mail question, Ingrid. Like, I was worried about that myself. <laughs> <laughs> like, or, or or fraud in the mail. Um, so, Gary, I am so glad that you are being wise and staying in and having someone else shop for you. Um, because you clearly meet both the age and the underlying condition criteria. So you are just the kind of person who it's most important that we're doing these precautions for. In terms of whether it makes the calculation for your, you and your wife about going to the grocery store versus ordering in, uh, keep bring, uh, continue to bring it back to reducing social contact. So uh, a reducing your wife's social contact in, in, in addition to you staying in the home. So when she goes out to the grocery store, ideally we're, we're recommending that she stay six feet away from other people. Now when you stand in line to check out, that's pretty difficult. 
So one would argue it could be safer to have to she will she will have social contact inevitably when she goes to the grocery store. Will have a hard time staying six feet away from other people. Um, you'll have less risk of that if you have the groceries delivered in. And then to your more detailed questions about the best way to sanitize anything that you've had delivered in, or, or um, I would defer to Dr. D'Angeli and some of the previous conversation we've already had uh, for that and for Doug's pressing question about the mail. <laughs> Great questions. Um, so uh, as far as your mail, um, this is one of those things where, I mean, you can't really spray it down or wipe it down because uh, you will ruin it. Um, and so in that situation, you're handling things that have been handled by other people. You could open it, set aside the in, inside part, and clean your hands, and then go about reading it. Um, when you're touching things that you haven't personally insured or cleaned, you should plan on washing your hands or using hand sanitizer after you touch those things. Um, I mean, you know, we have to try to thread the needle, uh, carrying on our life and staying safe. Um, and the nose in, you know, that is something that I, um, I see it's used to decolonize the nose when somebody is a carrier of methicillin resistant Staph aureus, MRSA. Um, and I am not aware of its use um, outside of healthcare, so I really cannot comment on that. Okay, great. Thank you again for those answers. We have one final question, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, Danny from Seattle. Danny. Danny. Hello. Hey, Danny. Danny. <laughs> Hi, Danny. Go ahead. Here's my question. I'm wondering about post uh, testing. What I mean by that is during the month of December, I had a very, very bad pneumonia. Hard for folks to figure out what was going on. It took probably about six weeks, seven or eight weeks to get past it. And, you know, I'm just curious about post-testing if I had it. Um, I don't want to get it again, but just to get more information about that and if people who were sick in the month of December, should they be concerned? Well, I can I can try with that one. So, Danny, um, if... It, well, I'm sorry you were so sick, and I'm glad you're better now. Um, there are two tests um, that can potentially be done to identify the novel coronavirus. One is the one that's being performed now. It is the, um, the nasal swab um, that uh, is being performed, and it's a PCR. It, it looks for pieces of genetic material. Um, the other is a serology, and that is sometimes used to identify past infections. Like if we want to know whether we're immune to measles, we can do a serology to see whether we have that immunity. That sero serologic test is not widespread right now, um, so it would not be available. I can understand being really curious about what you had. Um, and um, what we've seen in other people with COVID-19 is that they tend to remain positive for about three to four weeks and then they're negative. So if you had had it in January, it's really unlikely that you would still be positive. So um, yeah, that's probably the, the, I think the answer is we just won't know what you had. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we're gonna have to wrap it up and I just wanna thank everyone who called in, everyone who was in the queue. I apologize if we didn't get to your question. Um, I especially wanna thank our expert public health experts, Dr. Marissa D'Angeli from the Washington State Department of Health, Office of Communicable Disease Epidemiology. Thank you, doctor, for your informative answers. And also uh, Ingrid Ulry uh, from the Seattle King County Public Health Department. You two have been incredibly informative in your answers. We've covered a lot of ground. I've never seen more questions in a teletown hall than we've had on this subject. And we've interviewed a lot of people. So we may have to ask you back. I don't know if that's a possibility. For those of you um, who didn't get your question answered, I would direct you to our website, www.aarp.org forward slash coronavirus. We're gonna post all of the information we've been talking about, all of the websites, um, and uh, there's a, just a ton of information, also links to the CDC. 
AARP Washington goal here is to provide objective scientific information for you to be able to cope with this. In the face of this crisis, um, you know, we really want to just serve people and keep them out of harm's way so that we can prevent it spreading to others. We hope you learned something about the coronavirus today and that you will be able to keep you and your loved ones healthy. Thank you for participating and have a great day. This concludes our call.